Ahoy, and welcome to episode one of The Jolly Reader. I'm your host, Captain Book. Today, we're going to focus on the book, The Girl in the Picture by Alexandra Monier. There's three parts to this book. I just read through part one, and that's what we're going to talk about today. It's chapters one through 11, and it's literally half the book. We're on page 135 of 260 by the end of this. First, I want to thank you guys for listening. I really appreciate the support. And I just want to let you know, if I feel differently about this book, because I'm pretty critical, I haven't quite enjoyed this yet. It is okay to feel differently than me. I think it's important that we all have our own opinions, but I will be upfront and say this has been a tough read so far. There's a lot of setup, not a lot going on. I'm hoping I can make this review more entertaining than actually reading the book. Also, I'm going to be super critical of the characters because they're fictional. They're not real. They're not real people. I don't feel this way about regular people that make these choices. I'm not usually this judgmental, but for the purposes of this overview, I'm going to feel a certain way. You'll know what I mean when we get into it. So some highlights of today's episodes are going to be a scar that is talked about way too much, a murder weapon, which is probably the most interesting thing that happens, and a ghost, maybe. It's very complicated. I'm still trying to figure it out, so we'll just get into that together. I also want to talk about, before we start start, there are three main characters. Chase is the kid who was murdered. Lana is the pretty popular one. And Nicole, or as I refer to her when speaking about this with my husband, born Nicole, she is a musician and she's like the nerdy one. And they pretty much right off the bat tell you there's like some sort of love triangle going on. So we'll get into that more. For my Degrassi fans, it's a JT situation where he just wanted some oatmeal. If you don't have any idea what I'm talking about, you're probably like 20 years old, but I will explain it later on. Part one is called Lana and Chase, and the narration goes between Nicole, who's talking in present day, and Lana, who's talking in the past, their junior year, like the last, the previous year. This part I thought was kind of cool. It's the prologue, and it's from Chase's perspective, October 24th, 2016. He is looking down at his own dead body, and he's kind of narrating what he's seeing, getting us started with the crime because he hasn't been found yet. He's in the woods behind the soccer field. He describes blood on his letter jacket. He says he wants to know the truth. His last words were you. Things are a little fuzzy because he's a ghost. Apparently he has no idea who murdered him. He says he remembers lips on lips, the sound of her voice calling after me, a sharp blade inches from my neck, and the last face before it all went black. He knows that two people will be investigated, And that, we are assuming, is Lana and Nicole. That's kind of where we leave off. That's how we head into the whole story. Chapter one is from Nicole's perspective. October 24th, 2016. It's their senior year. She plays violin. They talk about that a lot. When I read the front cover and they said she was a musician, I literally thought, like, band. I was in band all the high school. I played baritone, if you can believe it. So I'm thinking, oh, it shows band. No, this is like fancy, super, she could make a career out of this violin. I did not realize that. She, (laughs) this is kind of weird. Okay, so they go to a prep school, which also, I have no experience. So please bear with me. I went to a public school in a small town. I don't know anything except for what I've seen on TV shows about prep schools. She apparently had a sink installed in her dorm room. She's in a dorm by herself. She doesn't have a roommate. I don't even know if they call them dorms. I'm calling it a dorm. I don't know what else to call it. But she had a sink installed in her room so she doesn't have to be around the other girls. So she just like goes to the bathroom and then runs back to her room. She talks about having a raindrop shaped scar on her cheek and she's trying to use all sorts of cover up and things because she's really embarrassed about it. I don't, they talk more about it, but at this point you're just like, okay, that sucks, but who cares? She's walking to class, she starts hyperventilating, sits down on the stairs, and then she starts remembering falling and the earth scratching her face. So it's just foreshadowing. Still, halfway through the book, I don't know what happened to her face. So then it goes into 
describing Oyster Bay Prep School. And there's one half is the music wing, and then in, be- in the middle is the academic wing. And I honestly don't remember what's on the other side. Oh, I think the dorms are on the other side. And all I can think of is when Rory from Gilmore Girls goes to Chilton. She talks about the carpets being red velvet. I don't know. Public school kid. So she goes to biology class, and she sits down with her friend who comes up several times, Brianne. And they notice that the teacher isn't there. The kids in the class are just doing whatever they want. She talks about the newest senior class couple, Lizzie and Felix, are like making out or whatever. I wrote down their names thinking they might be relevant. And I still, I don't know. They never brought them up again. But I swear, if they were the killers or something, I'm going to say, I said it. We know who these people are. The teacher finally comes in. His name's Mr. Isaacs. And he tells them that a classmate... I don't think he says it's Chase. I'm not sure. Was found dead. And Nicole like freaks out. And in her head, she says that she feels an animal boiling up inside her and wants to like hurl at the teacher and claw the tears off his face. And immediately I'm like, murder, you're crazy. So then she mentions Lana, who hates her and made her hate social butterflies, which is really unfair. Okay. Just because you have one mean friend doesn't mean that all of us social butterflies are bad. But anyways, Lana's sitting behind her crying and all the classmates are comforting her. And Nicole kind of says to us, the reader, that they're comforting the wrong person. And you're like, oh, snap, what does that mean? And Nicole mentions that she's not crying and she doesn't understand why. Nicole's weird. So she tries to run out of the classroom and she runs straight into a police officer at the door Basically, I have in my notes is I super do not like Nicole. She's a downer and judgmental. I just am not feeling it. I went into this book thinking I'm going to feel for both these girls and I'm be like, there's no way they did this. I don't like either of them, really. I end up liking Nicole a little more than Lana and that's about it. But we'll get there. Chapter two. Lana is speaking and it's September 7th, 2015 of her junior year. This is going to get real annoying real fast. So Lana is talking about they're at some like school, like start of the year picnic thing. And she starts talking about the super hot new guy who's there with a soccer scholarship. She's talking about Chase and she literally only ever talks about his looks. Like I can tell you nothing about him from her perspective. He's just hot. But one thing I do like is she describes the other boys as having old money manners and hand me down sense of humor. Just pretty amazing descriptor. She is super aggressive and (laughs) does not want the other girls talking to him. So she like walks over to him and they flirt. It's stupid high school annoying stuff. She talks about how she hopes the other girls saw how into her he was and he thinks she's cute or whatever. She's super possessive already and says things like, if I play my cards right, it'll only be a matter of time before he's mine. And I'm like, okay, you guys, you have a lot of murderous qualities for being 16. Then we learn that Chase is the son of a congressman, which I'm just gonna say right now, they talk a lot about this. I don't feel like, you'll have to read the book, but they're very accurate on what like an actual congressperson does. But anyway, so he's the son of a congressman and he was recruited for soccer. So he just moved to this new school. So he's taking AP classes and Lana's not. She mentions that. We also learned that Lana's parents are alumni of this school and they had to bribe the school to get Lana in there. And all I can think of is in... Legally Blonde, where Warner had to bribe his way into law school. (laughs) So anyways, she decides to give Chase a tour of the school, and they're, like, flirting or whatever, and she gets a text from her mom asking if she has met Chase yet. And she deletes it and is like, I'm not doing this for my mom. So there's obviously something there. And then Lana takes Chase to the auditorium to impress him, I guess. And someone is there playing violin. Spoiler alert, it's boring Nicole. Nicole is playing with her eyes shut and doesn't see them or notice them. Chase wants to listen, and Lana's super annoyed. Get used to that. She's annoyed like 95% of the time. 
So he sits down to listen, and after Nicole finishes playing, she's all awkward. And they, being Chase and Nicole, connect. And Lana says she's confused why he's even talking to her, because Nicole is ugly and awkward. Like, okay, calm down. Lana introduces herself, and Nicole's like, girl, I know who you are. We've had classes together. And Lana doesn't even remember that, but she like, oh yeah, sure, sure, to try to impress Chase. Who cares? Nicole reveals that they're going to be roommates, and Lana is pissed. She wanted to be roommates with one of her friends, and she's like, how am I going to be roommates with this frizzy-haired weirdo? Then she gets par for the course, overly obsessed and territorial over Chase, and mad he even, like, considered talking to another human being. Like I said before, I do not feel bad for either of these girls. I don't know. It's not what I expected. Chapter 3. Nicole, October 24th, 2016. We're back in the classroom and the officer, who is Officer Ladge, which I want to know, author, please DM me. Did you go, officers, wear badges? Hmm, what can I name him? Badge? Ladge. Ladge sounds great. But anyways, Officer Ladge says that they expect foul play, and the last time that anyone saw Chase Alive was at Tyler Hemming's party, so they want to interview everyone that was at the party. And then Nicole says to the audience that she didn't plan on going to the party because she wasn't invited, but she got a text from, I would assume, Chase. I don't know. It doesn't really say. So she went to the party. She says she drank too much, and all she remembers is an argument and a kiss. Doesn't say with who. Kind of hope she, like, made out with some rando. That would be kind of funny. But anyways, Officer Ladge drops a huge bomb, and he's like, hey, uh, we want to talk to those closest to Chase, starting with dot, 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 not his girlfriend Lana, but boring Nicole. And everyone blows their top over it. And Lana is like, uh, excuse me, sir, I was his girlfriend. Nicole barely knew him. And I'm thinking, okay, first of all, you guys are roommates, so obviously they knew each other, even without this weird love triangle or whatever. It's unreasonable to say they barely knew each other under the circumstances. But anyways, Officer Ladge takes... I really feel uncomfortable saying his name. It just does not feel right. Maybe I'll just call him Officer Badge from now on. Officer Badge, he's like, my bad, and he takes Lana in for an interview first, which we don't hear anything about that, but... The next section, I think we might switch roles, and I think Lana might be present day and Nicole might be in the past. That would be kind of cool. I really hope that happens. Nicole tries to leave the room because she's feeling sick, and the teacher doesn't let her because Officer Badge told the teacher under his breath, don't let her leave. Okay, calm down, everybody. Also, she's underage. She has rights. She, one, should be able to have a parent present. Two, she's not arrested she can leave if she wants to just saying know your rights people she talks more about her scar it gets super annoying i'm not even gonna drag it out she just basically talks about how everyone looks at it and then she says some more weird stuff she says she hopes she looks like a monster forever because the only person she wants to look good for is dead great i don't want to hear more about the scar unless it has some weird harry potter detecting properties okay Now we're introduced to a female detective, Jillian Kimball. Jillian and Officer Badge take Nicole to the headmaster's office for an interview. She tells them that she basically said hi and bye to Chase at the party, like barely talked to him and left around 11. But she admits to us that she doesn't even remember leaving or what time she left. So Detective Jill doesn't buy it. She just straight up says, did you have a romantic relationship with Chase? Obviously, she already knows the answer if she's asking that. Amazing detective. Love it. Just, hey, this is what we're doing. Nicole says they were friends, that they were close, but he had a girlfriend. Obviously. Still. Then, Detective Jillian shows a crucial piece of evidence. It's a photo booth strip. Okay. When I first saw the title, I was like, the girl in the picture. I literally thought it was going to be like a picture of them passed out drunk on a couch cuddling or a picture of them making out. No, it's a photo booth strip. Like you go and you sit down and it takes like three or four pictures of you and you're all laughing and silly. 
Okay, also I feel like an idiot because there's literally a photo booth strip on the cover of the book. Anyways, when they bring up the photo booth strip, Nicole reminisces about a carnival they went to junior year and Chase calls it their first real date. And then she randomly mentions her scar again, which I thought she maybe got her scar at the carnival. I don't think that happens because of things that are brought up later, but we'll see. She says to the audience, she thought that he forgot about, I guess, their relationship and that she was the only one holding on to this. The detective just straight up asks, why does the boyfriend of Lana Riviera have these in his pocket when he died? So it's like, dun, 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 because I'm telling you, this is the JT York thing. So (laughs) it's time to explain. In Degrassi, in the early 2000s, JT was dating like this super hot cheerleader girl. And then his ex-girlfriend was like boring Nicole. And he's talking to his best friend, Toby. I forget what he describes the hot girl as, but he's like, when you're eating a really good taco or whatever, you like really like tacos, but sometimes you just want comforting oatmeal. Nicole is oatmeal. It's comforting. It's like what he truly wants. That's what's going on. So look it up. JT York, Degrassi, you'll know what I'm talking about. Any who. Chapter four, Lana, September 7th, 2015. So we're back to junior year. Also, <laughs> in my notes, the first thing, I don't even know what happened. The first thing I have is, am I supposed to feel bad for Lana? She is terrible. This should be fun. So Lana is describing her mom, who is a congresswoman. So now we know why she wanted... Lana to meet Chase. She describes her as like not lovey dovey, like super intelligent, super serious. She's talking to her mom on the phone, and her mom was like, Why aren't you in AP courses? Don't be that stereotype of a pretty girl that's dumb. Which, sorry, Lana, you haven't really proved to me that you're not those things. And I'm halfway through the book. I'm just gonna say right now, I don't think Lana did it because there's no way she's even smart enough. Anyways. She, here's her possessive stuff again. She tells her mom that Chase is her future boyfriend. Her mom asks if Lana did what she asked her to. Lana says to the audience that she did, but she has genuine feelings for him. And I'm like, based on what? She just describes his looks and then he gives her butterflies or whatever. And then he like talks about how she's hot. And then she's like, you're hot. and No, you're hot. No, we're both hot. And it's like, you don't like him. You just think he's hot. Stupid. Okay. They're 16, Maria. Calm down. Okay. Also, (sighs) here's Lana with her very, uh, Lana with her creative description of Nicole. She describes her as a frizzy haired creature. She finds out like just through them being roommates talking that Nicole is at the school on a scholarship, which Lana finds unappealing. (laughs) I don't, how, in what world is having a scholarship to a school unappealing? Oh, you get to go to school for free. Cool. I'm in college right now. If I could go to school on a scholarship because I was good at doing something I enjoyed, like sign me up. Unappealing. Ugh. Don't get me started. You know what? I don't even think I like Nicole. I think I just feel bad for her because all the terrible crap that Lana says about her. Okay. Nicole. Just through talking still, Nicole, we're just like character development over here. Nicole doesn't know her father and her mom was a single working mom. So Lana, super rich parents. Her dad's a lawyer. Mom's a congresswoman. Nicole didn't know her dad. Her mom's a single working mom. They couldn't be more different, but they're going to become friends. It's like classic plot in any movie. It's dinner time at the school and Chase is sitting with the soccer team and Lana's like on the other end of the table flirting and being loud and begging for attention while ignoring him because that's how you get people to like you. She says she thinks the whole soccer team is saying how lucky Chase is to even have her attention because they've all tried and failed. I'm gonna guess that some of them haven't failed. But anyways... Nicole comes into the cafeteria. Actually, it's probably not a cafeteria. It's probably a dining hall because they're all fancy. Nicole walks into the eating facility and Chase calls her over and starts talking to her. And of course, Lana's having none of this because it's her future boyfriend. So Lana calls Nicole to come sit with her. 
to impress Chase, be like, look, I can be nice, even though she hates every second of it. So then we skip forward to, I know, see, it's a lot of nothing. Character development. We got it. She's a jerk. Nicole's boring. Who cares? Chase is dead. Got it. So, it's the first official day of junior year, and she's woken up by Nicole, and she has a lot of mean stuff to say, per usual. And she has an email from the headmaster that she wants to, the headmaster wants to discuss like areas of concern. And then basically the rest of the section is her droning on about how popular she is and how everyone wants to be her or be with her. We got it. You've only discussed it 15 times in the first four chapters and half those chapters weren't even your chapters. So she gets to the headmaster appointment and she sees Chase in the waiting room And they have some super shallow conversation about how hot each other are. So she goes into the headmaster's office and she's like, my mom basically put the headmaster up to this. And the headmaster talks about how she only has a 3.5 GPA and Ivy Leagues don't want none of that. And she's like, I'm practically on the honor roll. I mean, 3.5 is not bad, but when you go to a prep school and you're trying to get an Ivy League, like, girl. So... This is like literally the first and only time that I have felt bad for Lana. She's talking about to us, the audience, that why does she even have to? Oh, no, I think she says this to the headmaster. She says, why do I even have to go to any of these schools? I don't care about this stuff. You live your best life. Just because your parents want you to go to Ivy League school does not mean you have to. So the headmaster says because her mom could be president and that Lana would be representing girls all over the country. It's a dumb reason. Whatever. You live your dreams. You don't have to do what your parents want for you. Don't become a serial killer or whatever, but, like, go to the college you want to go to. Or don't go to college at all. Anyways, back to the book. Some of my personal feelings are coming out. Okay. Now you know why I'm in college at age 29. So, Chase is waiting for her when she gets out of the headmaster's office, and they both admit to each other that their parents told them to talk to each other to gain something like politically, because I guess her mom and his dad are on opposite sides of certain bills and stuff. So by their kids dating, that will change things. I don't know. The whole thing, this is not how it works, at least not that I know of. But anyways, he said that he was talking to her because his parents told him to, but she's like really cool and she's really hot and she is obviously obsessed with him. So they both say that they're going to rebel by giving their parents what they want. Really? I don't just someone explain that to me. I don't. How is that? My mom told me to put away the dishes. So screw her. I went and put away the dishes. Okay, good one. You guys just date because you like each other. Who cares about your parents? Chapter five. Chapter five is Nicole's perspective and it's October 24th, 2016. Still on the same day of finding out he was murdered. So Nicole leaves the meeting with the detective and officer badge and goes to quote unquote their place. This is like her and Chase's secret place. It doesn't even sound that secret, but it's under a wooden bridge by the woods. But then she later talks about how there's water under the bridge. So like literally water under the bridge. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry. Puns. Okay. I apologize for being punny. So she goes to their secret place and she talks about their song. I don't know. She There's lyrics. I will spare you the corniness. Okay. They love each other. Whatever. I'll never leave you. Who cares? She talks about, it's almost like he could just come back and tell her about some elaborate prank he pulled, which I feel like that's foreshadowing. I'll get into that a little later when they talk about it more. So then Chase's roommate, Ryan Wyatt, finds Nicole under the bridge and she's like uh how do you even know how do you know to find me here I want to know where this bridge is you think it's a bridge on campus people probably cross it to get to places but you know whatever it's super secret so he said he knows about the place because Chase told him about their secret spot because this is where dot 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 and then she cuts him off and I'm like okay I'm gonna go ahead and guess virginity was involved But we'll see. They don't talk about it yet. So maybe in the next section we'll know what happened under the bridge. If you're telling me this is where they first kissed, I'm going to cry. Because how boring Nicole will be living up to her name. So Ryan tells her that the detectives searched 
him and Chase's dorm room. And we're going to find out that Nicole and Chase had a relationship. And she tells the, or she tells Ryan that they already interviewed her and that she wants to go back to Pittsburgh where her mom lives, but she can't because she's a person of interest. And then he says that she should come to the funeral and she's basically like, Lana would be pissed. And he's like, who cares? Just come. And then he leaves and Nicole, she sits there all day until it's night and she hears singing and she follows the singing voices. Okay. If you are sitting in the woods at an abandoned bridge and you hear singing, do not follow it. Okay? If you've ever seen, oh brother, where art thou? Do not go down to the river to pray. Okay? Don't do it. So, she hears the singing, follows it to a vigil awake at the soccer field. And Lana's up on this podium and she's doing a speech and she's staring down at Nicole and she's talking about how good of a friend Chase was and how he was an even better boyfriend. And it's like, okay, we all know that something happened with Nicole. Great boyfriend. So weird. Whatever. Whatever you have to tell yourself, Lana, to get through the day. If you need to tell yourself he was a good boyfriend so you can be the victim, you just go right ahead. So a limo pulls up with Chase's parents with his little brother, Teddy, and Lana and Ryan go up and greet them and Nicole leaves chapter six we're over halfway we're making it we're building plot chapter six september 25th 2015 okay this is this is a pretty good chapter it's decent so there's a meteor shower and lana convinces the astronomy teacher who could quote unquote sleep through a tornado to let the class set up a camp out to watch it but really she wants to throw a party (laughs) She says she wants to get out of her uniform, sneak drinks, and flirt with people to make Chase jealous. Great basis to start a relationship. 100, I think you're the perfect couple. I love how I'm like super judging her for flirting with other people when they're not even dating, but he has a full-blown affair, it sounds like. Affair, they're 16. Okay. So she's setting up for the party, and she's being a jerk and super condescending to Nicole, which is super usual. And... (laughs) Just, I just want to keep pointing out how horrible she is to Nicole when we don't even hate each other yet. The party starts, and Lana... <laughs> okay, Lana is showing off her abs and dancing to Shakira because that girl's hips do not lie. I don't even know. That's probably not even the Shakira song they were listening to in 2015. Oof. I'm Googling this real quick. Time out. Okay, I Googled it. Hips Don't Lie came out in 2005. I was in high school. Lana would have been like five or six years old. So that's probably not the Shakira song she was dancing to. Okay. So she's shaking her hips and she knows this Chase is watching, but she's, she's playing hard to get. Two hours later and three drinks later, all the other girls are trying to talk to Chase. And she, so <laughs> instead of just like going to go talk to her friend slash guy who thinks she's hot, she decides to just dance with whoever and laugh the loudest and be super annoying for attention and just let her insecurities just hang out for everyone to see. Chase does not care. He probably cares a little bit more than I do, but pretty much none. He does not care about this. And he starts talking to Nicole. So of course, Lana flips her lid. So she's like, why would he be wasting his time talking to boring Nicole when I'm practically offering myself to him, which is how is dancing with other guys offering yourself? Okay. Okay. Lusa. To set it up, it's like a class thing. They have telescopes and they're supposed to chart the stars for their grade. So she goes over to the telescope that's set up near Nicole and Chase who are talking. She's playing it cool and they have like some flirty back and forth. He asks her to dance, but she won't give it up that easy. She literally admits that she's fishing for compliments. It's super annoying. Who cares? So she asks him, and she's all embarrassed that she even asked this. I feel like this is a valid question. She's like, what were you and Nicole talking about? He tells her that Nicole said that Lana is nice and cool and considers her a friend and that Chase should just man up and ask Lana to dance. And Lana's like, I don't understand why someone would be nice. Okay, just because you're a jerk doesn't mean that the whole world is. 
So they end up dancing and she's falling for him and her heart's fluttering. And she talks about falling for him like the girl she always made fun of. But she makes fun of everybody. So I don't really... So you're just acting like a human being? Got it. Okay. Later, Lana can't sleep. I don't know why I said this chapter is good. It's lukewarm at best. Okay. Later, Lana can't sleep and she sees Nicole's huge frizzy hair. All I can imagine when they describe Nicole's hair is from Princess Diaries, where she has like the big fro hair before her makeover. But anyway, so Nicole's big frizzy head walks past the tent. And Lana's like, what the what? So she gets up and they like go to go watch the actual meteor shower together at 4 a.m. And she asks Nicole why she encouraged Chase to dance with her. And Nicole's just like, because I'm not a trash human being. And Lana's like, okay, I guess I'll be her real friend now. Oh, good for you, Lana. You expect me to like you? I don't. (sighs) Okay. Chapter 7 is Nicole. It's October 24th, 2016. Same day. Seven chapters in, we're on the same day. Why are you putting dates on here for me? Nicole leaves the vigil and walks past where, like, the meteor party was once held. And she talks about, oh, I can't believe we were friends just a year ago. And then she says she wonders what it would be like if she recognized that Chase liked her instead of pushing him towards Lana. These girls with their insecurities, which save people a lot of trouble, and Chase probably wouldn't even be dead. But she does say that she doesn't regret her friendship with Lana. So that's a plus, I guess. So she's walking back to her dorm and this is so weird. Where is, where is she? So she says she's walking back to her dorm and she looks over to the woods and then she has this like weird flashback that she's describing to the audience. And she says in this back flash, she's trying to find Lana because Lana was supposedly throwing a party in the woods And she's stumbling around without a flashlight and she sees a sign on a tree that says party up ahead, but she doesn't hear party noises or see anyone else. And then she says she comes up to a low cliff and a fork in the path. And then a sick realization dawns on her and she pushes the memory away. She says, even though this memory is forced upon her and she sees like the aftermath of the situation, whenever she looks in the mirror. So this is how she got the scar. Zero details. So basically we know the ground did it. She fell. And it was when she was trying to find this party that may or may not have existed. So maybe she fell off this small cliff. I don't know. We don't know yet. So we're going to find out. So she returns to her dorm and she has a bunch of missed calls and texts from her mom and her one friend. She puts in her headphones. She's listening to music and she can swear she could hear Chase humming to the music and I'm like okay ghost we'll get into that more I'm not a fan of this ghost situation you'll see doesn't seem like much now but you'll see you'll see so we're still on Nicole's section and it's the next day finally October 25th 2016 Nicole's friend Brienne comes to her dorm and she has pushed back all these people that are ridiculous crowd of girls just being teenage girls be mean. So Brienne throws her laptop on Nicole's lap and is like, what the heck is this? And it's the photo booth pictures and they're all over the internet. And there's a news headline that says, the case of Chase Porter and the girl in the picture. We found our book title finally. It only took seven chapters. I will say I really like when you find the book title in the book. It's stupid, but I like it. So Brienne is mad because she had no idea that, uh, I always figure her name. That's why I call her boring Nicole. I literally can't remember her name. Sorry to anyone named Nicole. You were beautiful and wonderful, but this Nicole, boring, can't remember her name. So Brienne's mad because she did not know that Chase and Nicole were dating. And Nicole basically ignores her. It's like, how do these pictures get out? <laughs> Oh my gosh. Brienne says, oh, they're all over. TMZ leaked it. And it's like, oh, jeez. TMZ. That's reliable. Your school is so popular that TMZ is news headlines about you. So anyways, Brienne talks about, oh yeah. So Brienne, 
Brienne is a hard hitter. She holds nothing back. So she's like, uh, that was a pretty terrible thing to do to your supposed friend Lana. Uh, how do you sneak around with her boyfriend? And she mentions how Nicole practically dumped Brienne and their friend group to be friends with Lana and her friends. And then she says this. She goes, I guess now I know why you came running back to us. Oh my gosh. Okay, don't hold anything back, Brienne. Her boyfriend just died. Whatever he was. So... God. Barf. Okay, get ready. Get your barf bags. Nicole says, her and Chase fell in love, and it was real. Something you can't fight. And then Nicole says to us, it sounds rehearsed because that's exactly what they told Lana before the end of junior year. And Brienne is like, if you're saying it's real love, then why were you sneaking around behind Lana's back? Valid point. Why didn't you just tell her the truth instead of him cheating on her? And Nicole says to Brienne, we did tell her the truth. Here's my thing. They told Lana that they had a relationship, but Nicole's best friend knew nothing about this. How? Shouldn't the whole school know about this? I need more details on this situation. Okay, so Nicole tells Brienne that her and Chase were going to be together, but then the accident happened, and... Brienne's like, okay, did this shallow guy dump you because of a scar on your face? That's ridiculous. Agreed. And Nicole says, no, it was both sides. Like, we agreed not to. And then she says she couldn't be with him because everyone would be looking at her face. I gotta find the quote in this because it's way better. She says she couldn't be with him because everyone's eyes would be on her face and she didn't want everyone looking at her when they were finally together. But I feel like that doesn't make sense because everyone would be looking at her face anyways and everyone thought she was like a frizzy haired weirdo. So why would she care if people were looking at her scarred face when they were together? Maybe he cared. I don't know. We're still waiting on kind of confirmation details on that. And maybe it's about how she got the scar. Like maybe he, I think maybe he caused the scar. He couldn't be with her because every time he looked at it, he felt bad or something. She also, this is kind of like, I don't know how I feel about this. So she tells Brienne that she didn't tell her about the relationship because Brienne had just broke up with her boyfriend who is some kid she saw at summer camp or something. And then she never talked about him again after that. And Nicole didn't want it to be that way. She still wanted to talk about Chase. Whatever. I don't know. It's weird and it's stupid and it's high school drama nonsense. So at this point, these clever teenagers are in the hallway yelling, Scarface slut. I don't know. They could be cleverer than that. Let me think. I can be more clever than a teenager. Ooh, I know. They should have called her the Scarlet Harlot. Because scar on her face and scarlet letter. See, I'm more clever than a high schooler. Okay, anyways, that was harder than I expected. I'm going to give you guys Scarface Slut. It does not roll off the tongue, though. So, Brienne tells Nicole to go home. And Nicole's like, I can't because of orchestra showcase performance. And she has to do it because that's all she has left without Chase. I thought we already decided that she's a person of interest, so she can't leave. Nothing makes sense because we're in 16-year-old's brains. Really sorry if you're 16. I'm sure you're amazing. You're a lot more smart than regular 16-year-olds if you're listening to this podcast. We don't discriminate here, only against fictional characters. Okay. Nicole asks Brienne if she should talk to Lana, and Brienne tells her that she should do what she should have done last year and stay away from Lana. So Nicole hides in her room, calls her mom, and her mom's all worried about her scholarship and says she's going to get a lawyer and all this stuff. Nicole, genius Nicole, checks her Facebook and people are asking her, like strangers, if she murdered Chase and so she gets upset, clearly, because people on Facebook are terrible. So she deletes her Facebook, which I don't think Detective Jillian is going to like that, but whatever suspicious and then she hears chase this is just what she says i don't know if it's real or if it's in her head i do know because i read forward but at this point i don't know she hears chase tell her to play the song that she played when they first met to like make all this craziness go away or something so she does so then it's dinner time and detective jillian kimball and officer badge officer Ladge badge comes to nicole's room And Nicole asks them how the picture got out. And they're basically like, that's normal. It would happen anyways. Which, okay, maybe. But she's 16 or 17. Like, can't you be like, sorry, that sucks? Detective Jillian does not like Nicole. She's like really mean to her the whole time. 
So anyway, they tell her that they're going to add security cameras and she's going to have an escort to all her classes. I don't know why this keeps coming up. She tells them she's going to go stay with her mom. And they're like, "Uh, you can't because investigation is not concluded. We've talked about this 15 times. You're not leaving the school. And she asks them if she's in trouble. And they're like, not yet. But they need to investigate the people closest to the victim. Because we all know the wife murdered the husband. That's just how it goes. Why aren't we looking at Lana? Hopefully we get into that at some point. So then to top it all off, they have a, a search warrant for her room. And she's super upset. They take half her stuff. They take her laptop. They rummage through all her personal stuff. She's super embarrassed because she has pain meds and scar cream on her bathroom sink that was installed in her room, which you shouldn't be embarrassed about that. Also, I'm just realizing this. So she talks about earlier in the party that she had one drink, but she's like super drunk and doesn't remember anything. So I wonder if it's because she was taking her pain meds mixed with like alcohol. Anyways, she freaks out when they look at her violin because it's like her prized possession. And they're like, we're not going to take it. We're just looking. Okay. So they just open it, look at her violin, put it back. There's nothing to confirm this. But if any of you were in band or whatever, you know that you can take usually the padding out of the instrument case and you keep your music or you can keep stuff back behind there. So I'm like thinking maybe she freaked out because she hid something important in the case of her violin. And if she didn't, then the author just wasted a really good opportunity. So anyways, we're getting there. Not only do they search her whole room, they're like, oh, by the way, Chase's parents wants to talk to you tomorrow, so best of luck without that because they saw the photo. Chapter ends. Her chapters end a lot better than Lana's. Chapter 8, Lana, December 18th, 2015. She talks about how her and Chase have been dating for two months, including one month Facebook official. So one month dating. They go to a fancy restaurant so she can meet his parents for the first time. And I I don't know why I have in this. She sure thinks a lot of herself because she's just talking about her looks and the perfect outfit and how they'll love her. And parents always love her and blah, blah, blah. She's perfect. In case you hadn't already known, she's just the greatest thing that ever walked this earth. And then <laughs> this is a quote from her. They'll rave about me as soon as I leave the room, just like Chase's teammates do. Okay. I don't know. That doesn't seem like flattery to me. I'm super hot and dumb. Yay. And you want his parents to think that? I don't know. I'm just not feeling it. So anyways, I don't know. I included this part because I feel like it might come back around. And if it doesn't, I'm sorry for wasting your time. So at the dinner, they ask about her mom, like, oh, how's your mom? Blah, blah, blah. And she says the congressman makes a smirk, but she can't quite tell what there is more to that, like what he knows that she doesn't. I don't know. That may or may not come around, but I thought I'd add it here. So we're not confused if it does come back. So they ask about her schooling and stuff, like if she's into any activities or whatever. And she's super insecure because all she has is good looks. And that's her segment about herself. And Chase's mom is like disappointed that she isn't into the arts or anything like that, like playing music or on the dance team. It's really awkward. So I think Chase brings up that she's good at dancing. And I'm assuming we're talking about the Shakira belly dance she did. Why would you bring that up to your parents? And then his mom's like, oh, are you on the dance team? She's like, no. (laughs) Yeah. So then his mom's like, "Mm, not impressed. Then Lana tries to gain points with his parents by saying, not only is Chase a good soccer player, but he's the nicest, humblest guy. He probably never gave you a day of trouble in his life. Immediately, Chase and his parents get super awkward. They start exchanging looks and then they ignore what she even said and starts talking about the school instead. So we're like, oh, what's that all about? Finally, maybe something interesting that we're not going to find out about this time. Dinner apparently ends and then Lana and Chase go back to his dorm room. Chase's roommate is out on a date and Lana is complaining to the audience that their relationship has been PG and she wants more. You're 16. It's okay. It's okay for her to be PG. So since she wants more, the casual way to get that is to bring up the comment at dinner about him being a troublemaker. And he says to her that some people are bad on accident or are forced into it. And it was immature drama and it's not even worth talking about. So then he starts making out with her. And of course, the dumb, dumb airhead girl she is, she's like, oh, I forgot all about the thing that might be really important. Like he could have a baby somewhere. He could have deafened someone by punching him in the ear. It's another Degrassi reference, if anyone wants to know. So (laughs) I'm really showing my age in this episode. Okay, 
So while they're kissing, they like go back and forth saying they like each other. Like, I really like you. I really like you too. And the only reason I bring that up is because every time we see Nicole's perspective, she says that her and Chase loved each other. And Lana section only talks about how they like each other. Just an imbalance of how the relationships were. Okay, so the roommate shows up at like 2 a.m. So she goes back to her dorm and... We don't really know how far they went. And like I said, I'm not interested in fictional 16-year-old romantic life. But I do feel like if Chase and Nicole have progressed farther in their relationship than him and Lana, I don't know. I just feel like it's kind of relevant to the dynamics of the two relationships. So when she gets back to her dorm, Nicole's there and tells her that she got into the New York Philharmonic and Lana wonders what it'd be like to be the very best at something. But then she says, but I wouldn't want to be the best at something because then she wouldn't get to be herself and wouldn't be the girl that Chase likes. Okay, lol to that. Who doesn't want to be the best at something and who cares if a stupid boy likes you? Like, I'd rather be the best and then have the boy like me because I am the best. But I kind of see your point because am I the best podcaster? No. But do I get to be myself? And do I have a husband that likes me? Yes. So, I don't know. Okay, Nicole says that she feels bad because Brienne didn't get in. They both applied. And Lana tells her to just rip off the band-aid and just tell Brienne. And I'm like foreshadowing because apparently that's what Chase and Nicole did when they told Lana that they were in love. We only have three more chapters. Chapter 9, October 25th, 2016. This is Nicole. So Nicole gets a text from Lana. We don't know what it says, which is really weird, but she talks about the text above it, which was on May 26th that says, go to hell. We're assuming that's when Nicole and Chase told her about their relationship. And then the previous message above that is May 10th, and it's all friendships XOXO. And she just kind of like talks about how quickly their friendship fell apart. Nicole responds to this unknown message from Lana with, what do you mean? But we don't get a response or anything. So hopefully that kind of comes back. Nicole needs some fresh air. So she sneaks out of her room in the middle of the night. Of course, she doesn't have a flashlight. And she's wandering the halls and she hears talking in the dining hall. And it's Lana's mom, Chase's parents, and the headmaster. And the headmaster is like, "Uh, you couldn't possibly think Nicole's involved. She's just a teenager. And Lana's mom says she wants a report put out that Lana had nothing to do with it and sh- that she thinks Nicole did it. And the headmaster's like, uh, the police have to decide if Lana had nothing to do with it. I have no control over this. And then Chase's mom's all mad because Chase's dad and Lana's mom are making this about politics. And then Chase's dad says that they have to do everything to protect their family. And then Nicole leaves because she doesn't want to get caught when they like come out of the room. And she says she hears her and Chase's song. This is, okay, you guys, buckle up because we're about to get into something that makes no sense. Things are about to get weird. This, I did not like. I don't feel like it fits with the flow of the book. It's just really odd. Okay, so she follows the song she hears and she sees Ghost Chase on the steps of Joyce Fall. Now, I was thinking the girl's losing it. She's grieving. She's seeing things. I think the author wants us to know this is a real ghost. Don't get me wrong. I am a believer in the ghost. But I don't feel like it has a place in this book, except for in the beginning when we're introducing Chase seeing his body. The reason I think that this is supposed to be a real ghost is because he says to her that he's breaking the rules by even letting her see him. I don't know if you're like hallucinating why he would say that. But he says to her that he shouldn't be there, but doesn't want to leave her and make the same mistake twice. And the answer to his murder is in the days when they fell in love last spring. So then Nicole asks if Lana killed him. And he says he has a hard time remembering who the killer is, but he says generally Lana's not a killer. He doesn't say she didn't kill him, but he says that she doesn't have that in her. Which I think we all learn from freaking Ted Bundy. Just because you're considered attractive doesn't mean that you're not a freaking murderer. So I'm not ruling out Lana yet. Ghost Chase tells her that if anyone can uncover the truth, it's you. Remember the days of you and me and the answer is there. I can feel it. And then he vanishes. I feel like she could have been like, 
oh, let me backtrack to our relationship to figure out what events led up to him being murdered. I don't feel like I needed a ghost talking to her to lead us in that direction. It's the next day, and... <laughs> Nicole says that her unkempt hair and lack of sleep and scar makes her look like a supervillain. Foreshadowing? Maybe. She said some really creepy weird stuff so far. So Nicole's mom comes to see her and Nicole meets her lawyer, John Stanford. And he tells her that she needs to act normal, go to class, not act suspicious, that she needs to do all this also so she doesn't lose her Juilliard scholarship. And they're upset, clearly, that the investigators talked to her and searched her room because uh, she's underage. Her parents should have been present, but whatever. You guys, if police ever investigate you, even if you're innocent, tell them you want a lawyer. Okay? Because you might say something stupid. Just say lawyer. It's all she had to do. Lawyer. And then they couldn't talk to her. Dumb. And we don't even know if she did it, but I'm just saying, even if you're not guilty... Okay, so she tells her mom and her lawyer that she has to meet with Chase's parents, and the lawyer says that they're grieving parents who need someone to blame. Don't trust them. Chapter 10, only two more chapters. Things happen in the next two chapters. The first 10 chapters, nothing has happened. Lana, annoying popular girl. Nicole, boring, weirdo, frizzy hair girl. Chase, dead ghost. Basically summed it up for you guys. Chapter 10, from Lana's perspective, December 31st, 2015. Nicole and Stephanie, which is Lana's best friend, are getting ready at Lana's parents' house in D.C. for a yearly New Year's Eve party. And, of course, Lana has to criticize Stephanie for the way she eats and Nicole's hair. But she only says to the audience. She never says this stuff out loud. You know what's worse than a bully? A bully that can't own their stuff and just say it to the people's faces. Like, it's real easy to criticize. I'm criticizing these characters right here for the world to hear. I'm not afraid because they're not real. But I'm just saying, she can't even Lana up and say it out loud. I bet her meanie mom congresswoman would say it out loud. Anyways, this part's kind of long. I'm going to summarize it real quick. So Lana has a housekeeper that comes in and then this triggers Nicole to talk about how her mom used to be a housekeeper. And Nicole's like basically saying how her mom would go take care of other kids while she had a little kid at home being Nicole, and does the housekeeper have kids, blah, blah, blah. So Lana is in her natural state and gets super annoyed, and she tells the audience she should not have to apologize for the luxury that her parents earned, and that feeling this way is Nicole and Gabby's problem because of their experience. Okay, if I even have to explain to you why this is just ridiculous, I need you to go talk to someone that's experienced something different from you. Moving on. So Lana doesn't have to deal with, you know, people that (laughs) have less than her, that are below her. She goes to see her mom, who's getting ready, and Lana is kind of depressing in her dialogue, and she just says, like, she's not intelligent like her mom, and her mom's so determined, and and she's not. But, like, at the same time, Lana's literally done nothing to convince me otherwise. So far, all I see is a pretty face with no substance. I don't see anything because I'm reading a book, but you know what I mean. So Lana's mom is going to let her hairstylist do the girl's hair and specifically comments on Nicole's frizzy hair. And they're going to give her like a Princess Diaries makeover and make Boy Moose go, wah! Watch Princess Diaries if you haven't. So Lana's mom asks about Chase and Lana says he's amazing and it feels good for her to, to walk around school with him on her arm, which I thought was like a really interesting gender role switch. He's on her arm like she's big and bad and he's her accessory. I don't know. I just thought that was kind of interesting how Lana put that. Lana's mom drops this bomb that the congressman being Chase's dad and Mrs. Porter, his mom, have an unreported bank account that they funnel a few hundred thousand dollars to somewhere in Brooklyn. Just a few hundred, just drop in a couple hundred thousand, whatever. Just like pennies in the bank. So she wants Lana to ask Chase about it and Lana's like, um, no. So the congresswoman's like, I'll just ask his parents myself when they're here. So my theory is that this money is going to pay off whatever Chase got in trouble with or his baby or something, something up. Hope we find out at some point. So we're at the party and (laughs) Lana describes Nicole as looking more than decent, which I'm offended by. I feel like that's what I look like. Just a little more than decent. Just like solid six. She says it's so negative. I'm like, more than decent. That's a good day. I put on pants. 
I also uh, straightened my hair and put on mascara, which was a lot for me before this episode, so I could take a picture for Instagram. Anyways, Chase shows up late to the party, and his parents aren't there because his grandma was sick or something. And Chase kisses Lana and hugs Stephanie and Nicole. And then Lana wonders if she should be worried about Nicole, but dismisses it as crazy. I have such mixed feelings because Lana, you are crazy. You're so overbearing and secure. But then at the same time, Kim and Nicole did have something. So something was going on. I don't know. Just the way her character is written, like makes me feel not sorry for her at all. Moving on. So Lana's mom asked Nicole to play violin at the party. And Chase says under his breath to Nicole that she doesn't have to, but she says it's fine. So Lana's not having that at all. She says she's mad because he's more concerned about Nicole than Lana and her mom. But she agrees that her mom shouldn't have made her play. You're mad at your boyfriend for doing exactly what you're thinking. Oh, the world's ending. Lana is a walking, talking oxymoron. I cannot stand it. Okay. She also asked to herself, why should he intervene? He's not her boyfriend or whatever. Probably because he's not a trash human being. Well, she kind of is because he cheated on his girlfriend. But. In this circumstance, I feel like you have a friend and they're put in an uncomfortable situation. Wouldn't you intervene too? I don't feel like that's anything to be upset about. She should be happy that her boyfriend doesn't suck. So Nicole performs for everyone and they're all awestruck and everything. Like people are described as crying. And Lana has to remind herself that Nicole's her friend. Is she though? Is she your friend? Because you literally never acted like she was your friend ever. But she has to remind herself that Nicole's her friend. She should be happy for her. But she doesn't, of course, like the way Chase and everyone is captivated by her music because it makes her feel like nothing in comparison. Newsflash, Lana, you have no redeemable qualities, okay? At least Nicole can, like, do something. So when Nicole's done playing, Lana's mom uses it as a photo op, and the end of the chapter is just Lana saying to the audience repeatedly, I'm happy for her. I really am. I'm not jealous. I'm not jealous to try to convince herself. Final chapter. Things are happening. Here we go. Chapter 11, Nicole's Perspective, October 26, 2016. This part is like such a wash. There's crowds outside the school because of the murder. So Nicole tells her lawyer to meet her inside the theater, but regrets it because that's where she first met Chase. And then she remembers her favorite song, which is what she played at the New Year's Eve party. It's kind of a waste of time. It's just a way to like bring the New Year's Eve party back into Nicole's section now. Skip ahead. Brianna and Nicole are walking to class and they run into Ryan and he asks her if she heard about the murder weapon and it was confirmed that it was a kitchen knife and that it was probably swiped from the party. So Brianna is annoyed that Nicole confided in Ryan and not her about the relationship with Chase. Ryan is Chase's roommate. I don't know. Brianna, calm down. Jealous much. We got enough jealous people in this book. We don't need one more. So Lana walks up to them and Nicole sticks her hand out as like a good faith gesture, I guess. And Lana spits on the floor in front of her. Of all the things you can do, Lana, you just spit on the floor. I was hoping she'd slap her. Not promoting violence. I'm just saying it'd be a lot less boring than spitting on the floor. The security guard pushes Lana away from Nicole and Lana like laughs and bitterly walks off. Good one, Lana. And Nicole tells Ryan and Brienne that they don't have to be seen with her. And Ryan's like, Chase would want us to be seen with you. So then there's a rumor going around that Nicole killed Chase because he would not dump Lana for her. And they like assume that Lana started the rumor. Stephanie, the other friend, walks past and she's indirectly talking to Nicole. She's like talking to her boyfriend, but she's being really loud and rude about it. And she says, the cops are searching rooms for the murder weapon and she would be nervous if she was Nicole. Then Nicole tells the audience that the thought of meeting Chase's parents with a lawyer made her feel guilty. She doesn't really explain why, though. So she's going to go with her mom. So they meet his parents in the alumni club, which is in the basement of the school. Super exclusive. Everyone has their own individual custom key. There's a French elevator to get them down there. And she describes it as like a speakeasy It reminds me of, from the show Riverdale, like Veronica's basement club thing. I just kind of want to know, anyone that went to, like, a really fancy school, I want to know if there was a French elevator, or there's, like, secret room. I need to know how accurate this is, because every TV show, there's weird stuff at these fancy schools. Public school me does not know. Like, at my small town school, we had bring your tractor to school day. Okay? That was as fancy as it got. So... Talking to Chase's parents, Chase's parents say to Nicole, 
They don't understand Nicole's relationship with her son because he was dating Lana at that point for almost a year. And they tell her that Chase never mentioned Nicole to them. And Nicole says that Chase told her that he did tell his parents and that he was planning on breaking it off with Lana last spring. And they say, oh, the congressman? Burn. He says, yeah, he didn't talk to us and he didn't break it off with Lana either. So, and I'm just like, oh, jeez. Okay, spitting fire over here. So Nicole spits back and she's like, there was reasons on both sides for that. Chase's mom looks at the scar, which implies that he did tell them about their relationship, or at least, like, what happened to her. So then, Nicole's mom's like, uh, obviously our kids did like each other, just look at the pictures. So I didn't explain before, but in the pictures, she's sitting on Chase's lap, and they're, like, laughing and stuff. They're not, like, kissing, but they are about to, it looks like, or whatever. It's definitely, like, a romantic situation. So Chase's dad says that there's a rumor that Nicole photoshopped the pictures, I also feel like it'd be really hard to Photoshop an actual a photo booth strip because it's just like printed out in a strip. It's not like something that you load up on your computer and then you just Photoshop it. It's not like that. It's like a printed picture. I don't know. That's a stretch. So anyways, Nicole freaks out and she's yelling that whatever they heard is all lies and Chase kept all their letters in his dorm and the detective is like, we haven't found anything yet. And then Nicole's like, check his phone records and the detectives basically says nicole and chase hadn't spoken the week of his death which nicole's tells her basically duh we like our relationship was last spring why are you looking at just this past week which i agree so then nicole tells them to talk to ryan the roommate because he'll confirm their relationship then she says whatever he had with lana doesn't matter because he loved nicole and nicole loved him which is like super awkward to yell at a dead kid's parents So Chase's mom asks if they can trust Nicole, and Nicole says she's filled with dread but doesn't know why. So I don't know. Hopefully that's explained. Nicole's mom's over it and is like, let's go. And before they leave, Nicole says that she's going to play violin at Chase's funeral, and he loved her music more than anyone else, and then she walks out before they can basically tell her no. Okay, you guys, we're at the very end, and stuff is about to happen. Nicole's mom goes back to her hotel and Nicole goes back to her dorm. She's looking through her desk for the letters to prove that they had a relationship. And she opens the drawer and there's a kitchen knife with dry blood on it. Murder weapon. Ugh. Okay, so she screams and then she runs and locks her door. Which, what? I would be like freaking out. I wouldn't even think to go lock my door because... Her security guard is outside and he knocks on the door and asks her what she's screaming about. I would have been screaming. He would have come in. I would have been like, bloody knife. I don't know. And then he would have arrested me and I would have been found guilty of murder. So she locks her door. He knocks on the door and security guard and he's like, what's wrong? And she's like, oh, I saw a spider. I'm not going to unlock the door. And he's like, okay, good enough. I only get paid minimum wage later. And he's just waiting outside her door still. So (laughs) yeah. So she goes back and forth on what she should do. And she talks about how it's obvious she's being framed because they had just searched her room the day before and didn't find this weapon that's just in a desk drawer. She says she doesn't want to say anything because of the rumors going around that she murdered him. So she decides to get rid of it in a place where the police can find it. You just said that you're obviously being framed because the weapon was found in your room. So just tell the police that, hey, my room has a knife in it that wasn't there before. I mean, I kind of get her thought process, but people always do this in shows and movies. I'm going to go hide this instead of being honest and hope I don't get in trouble. So she puts on a winter glove. She grabs a knife, puts the knife in the plastic bag, and then puts the plastic bag in her backpack. She turns on her headphones because when you're trying to sneak around, you don't want to hear what's going on around you. Okay. But she says she hears Chase saying, find me at our spot. So that weird hidden bridge. She climbs out her bedroom window, which according to her is luckily only on the fourth floor. Only on the fourth floor. You know how high four stories are? And it talks about shimmying across the windows and hopefully no one's windows open to see her. It's not like she's going down a fire escape. But anyway, she gets to the bottom, doesn't think anyone saw her. Of course, as usual, she forgot her flashlight. So she's just running around campus 
in the dark until she hears the water that's under their special bridge. This is not, this is just a bad plan. So she worries about what she might find at this bridge and she wonders if she'll see Chase's spirit again. And I'm just thinking, God, I hope not because it doesn't make any sense. So she gets there and she hears someone say her name, Nicole, and she turns around and that's the end of the chapter and we don't know who it is. And I promise you, I did not read any more. I don't even know who it is. And as soon as I'm done recording it, I'm going to go see who's under this bridge. For the end of this episode, I have a couple theories and some lingering questions. So back in like chapter four, my original theory was that Lana's mom murdered him because he says his last words were you. So he recognized Lana's parents because he met them. And he says, I knew this would happen if I chose her, if I strayed from the path laid out before me. So the path being Lana and who he chose being Nicole. So I don't know. I just kind of thought like Lana's mom might be mad about that. So then when talking to my husband, I was talking to him about how much I wanted to include Brienne in this podcast because I feel like she's not a super important character. And then the more I talked about it, the more I thought maybe she murdered him. Now, the reason I think Brienne might have done it is because, not necessarily because she wanted him dead, but she wanted to frame Nicole for it. Because she was jealous of the New York Philharmonic, Nicole getting into it. And then maybe if Nicole couldn't do it, maybe she would get her spot. I'm not really sure how that works. She had just broken up with her boyfriend, so like jealousy there. She doesn't like that Nicole ditched her or Lana. She had access to Nicole's room to plant the knife and frame her. And I didn't mention this earlier, but Nicole talks about doing a duet of this like showcase with Brienne. So if Nicole was in jail or whatever, she would have a solo instead of a duet. And she makes a huge deal all the time that she knew nothing about the relationship with Chase, which I mentioned earlier is probably not true. It'd be really hard for her to not know. Maybe maybe she found out and lived out over it. I don't know. And then they also talk about the rumor about Nicole killing Chase, and they assume Lana said it, but maybe Brienne said that rumor. I don't know. I would love to hear your guys' theories on what you think so far, like who may have done it. I don't feel like we have a lot of information, so we'll see. Maybe we'll feel differently. So here's my lingering questions at halfway through the book. How did Nicole get her freaking scar, and why does it matter? This better be good, because they talk about it constantly, and why is it relevant to her and Chase not being together? My second question is, what happened in the woods at this supposed party that Lana was throwing? Was it a prank gone wrong by Chase? Was it Lana seeking revenge because she found out about their relationship? I want to know what happened. Next question, why did Lana stay with and or get back together with Chase if Nicole and Chase told her that they were in love? Why would you want to be with someone that's in love with someone else? I don't know. That was kind of weird. So my next question is, What did the text that Lana sent Nicole say? She just responds, what do you mean? But I want to know what that text said. I I feel like they're holding on to that for later in the book. So why is Ryan on Nicole's side instead of Lana's? This makes me feel like Chase, things Chase said about Nicole. I don't know. Ryan's like always defending Nicole and never, never running to the aid of Lana. So his opinion has to be based on what Chase said. So I kind of want to get into why he has the feelings he does, I guess. Why are we not talking about Tyler's party? This is where the murder took place. Obviously, it was an entire party before he actually got murdered. I feel like a lot of things happened, and we're not even trying to get into it. I'm very annoyed. And, of course, who's at the bridge? Who said her name? I'm going to guess Ryan, maybe, because he already found her at the bridge. Or Lana. That would be, like, really crazy. I don't know. Or one of the parents. I have no idea who's at this bridge. But I really, really hope it's not a ghost because I'm not feeling the ghost storyline. So that's about all I have. Um, you can follow me on Instagram at the Jolly Reader Podcast. You can DM me. You can make comments. I'd love to hear your theories. I want to hear your lingering questions. I'm just really excited to hear your input. Please subscribe to this podcast and you can get updates because you don't want to miss the next episode every other Tuesday. And please share, share, share. Tell your friends. Tell your family. You liked it. Leave a review. Unless you hate it. No, I'm just kidding. Leave a review. I'm open-minded. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I'd love to hear what you think. Also, if you stay tuned, you'll hear some outtakes. So if you want to laugh with me and or at me, stay tuned for that. I hope you guys had a great 4th of July weekend. It's actually 4th of July today while I'm recording this. 
And I just wanted to make a shout out to my awesome husband, Josh. He's an army veteran. So I just like really want to thank him for the sacrifices made and I'm excited to go celebrate with him. So shout out to him and all the armed forces. You guys rock. I'll see you guys in two weeks. So tune in next time for part two. I'm really excited. I'll talk to you guys then. I am Allie. And you are with me to my mom. Until we sail again, this has been the Jolly Reader. Bon voyage. Hey, you made it to the outtakes. Enjoy having secondhand embarrassment for me. Trigger warning, if you think burps are gross, uh, you should probably just skip over this part. It's natural, guys. Don't worry about it. Everyone does it. Here we go. It's dinner time at the school, and fly, get out of here. There's a fly. Get out of here. Don't buzz into my mic. Okay, it's dinner time. I think we're going to have to do outtakes, right? Public school kid. I, like, we were lucky. I don't know. I don't have a good joke here. Is this recording? Okay, sorry. Have to take a break. Okay. Jace? No, not Jace. Wow. Chase. Nicole? I don't know why I said it like that. Time out. Uh. Woo! Picked up on that. Uh. Keep burping. Better edit all those out. Okay. Uh. Wow. Why am I dying? I'm going to take a sip of my coffee, the fuel, the lifeblood. It's only 10 o'clock here. Okay. Whew. Jillian. Detective Jillian. Detective Jill. Kimmy. No, Kimball. Jillian. Detective Jill. Jillian. I want a good nickname for her. The Detect. <laughs> Detective Kimball. Oh, that's Jillian. Detective Chase, Ghost Chase, tells Ghost Chasers. Okay. My throat is so raspy. I already sound like a boy doing this early in the morning. It's not helping. Okay. <clears throat> Where am I at? Lost my place. Oh, okay. But she's, like, really cool, and she's really hot, like... And she is, like, obviously, I say like a lot. Sip my coffee. I've already peed three times during this and still drink coffee. Okay. Chill out. Okay. <clears throat> Why is my throat screwed up? Need some water. Okay. Do I sound like boy still? I think so. I actually, this is going to be in the outtakes, but. So I was substituting at my mom's preschool, and literally one of the five-year-olds walked up to me and said, You sound like a boy sometimes. So that's why I always talk about my man voice. And how he was an even better... I just drilled the table. She's playing hard to get. If I could stop hitting the table, that'd be great. Really cut down on my editing. And his little... The, his little brother, Lil. Lil Sebastian. Okay. Lion. Lion. That's a combination of Lana and Ryan. Che uh, cheeses. Nicole leaves the vigil. Vigil? Why can't I say that? So at this point, these clever teenagers are in the hallway yelling, Scarface slut. Which they could be like, I don't know. They could be clever than that. Like, picture imperfect murderer. Let me think. Let me think. I can be more clever than a teenager. I don't know. That's all I got. Picture imperfect puberty. I don't know. Of course, my husband called me. I'm coming home with our very loud four and a half year old. And I'm like, uh, go play outside. Oh, that's my garage door, because my husband's coming home. It's okay. Oh, now my kitten's running around. Poppy! I'm going to keep recording until the garage is shut. <laughs> Drink my coffee. Waffle, you better not start meowing. Don't you dare lick yourself. I don't want to pick that up. Okay, I think we're good. Oh, no. Still coming out of the car. Why are my dogs barking? Ugh, my dog. Patchy. Patchy! Stop it! So many noises at my house. Patch! Really sorry, I'm screaming into the mic. Patchy! So, stop it, dogs! To keep her from Waffle. Shh. Stop it, Waffle. Go. I'm about to throw you out of this room. My cat is sprawled out on his back. 
showing off. Bearing all. At least he's being quiet. Okay. What happened? Oh no, the battery in my PC is running low. I gotta go plug this in. Hold on a second. Say, please leave a review. Please leave a review. <laughs> please leave a review. Please leave a review. <laughs> please leave a review. Please leave a review. <laughs> <laughs>